Hello, my name is Sandra Perone, Professor of Arts and Humanities at Springfield Technical Community College and Gallery Coordinator of the Amy H. Carberry Fine Arts Gallery located in Building 28. Carberry Gallery strives to foster intellectual engagement and dialogue beyond the traditional classroom by breaking preconceived notions of a gallery as an exclusive space. One function of the gallery is to share who artists and photographers are and what they create, and to inspire students to pursue their creative endeavors and career goals. Fine arts courses are open to everyone here at STCC and the importance of visual literacy to every student's overall educational experience cannot be understated, no matter their major. I originally conceived of these virtual Carberry conversation interviews in response to the pandemic. 2020. Each interview covers a wide variety of topics, including origin stories, the impact of current events on artistic practice, um, and the function of art and photography. I continue to offer this virtual format to keep gallery programming fully accessible to everyone while creating an archive of these conversations available on YouTube as a community resource. Today, we celebrate the 20th episode of Carberry Conversations with a tribute to Amy H. Carberry. So it is truly an honor and most certainly a privilege to have Gail Carberry, Amy's mom, and Allison Carberry, Amy's sister, for this tribute interview. Before we start talking about Amy, I do want to properly introduce Gail and Allison. Dr. Gail Carberry, a graduate of STCC class of 77, a graduate of Worcester State, uh, Worcester State College and UMass Amherst, worked at STCC for 29 years, um, ending as vice president of institutional advancement. In 2006, Gail became the fifth president of Pensigamon Community College in her hometown of Worcester serving for 10 years before retiring in 2017 from the public se sector after numerous accomplishments at both STCC and at QCC. And Dr. Dr. Allison Carberry holds a BA from Wesleyan College and her PhD and master's from Boston University, where she has worked full-time since 2011. She is a master lecturer in Spanish, and since uh, 2019, Allison also works at, as the coordinator of the second semester Spanish program at Boston University. She has also received awards and recognition for her work at BU, most recently the LFA Spirit and Creativity Award in 2021. And so I welcome you both to the Carberry Conversations, <laughs> which you is a her. little, you're welcome, a little strange, a little wild, I have wanted to have this conversation for a long time, <laughs> and so I am thrilled to finally have this opportunity, and I can't thank you enough for agreeing to do this. We are very happy to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk about Amy, but it's also wonderful to see the gallery in action and, and the arts program in action. So Yes, and for, and for me, you know, um, it's so important because... Um, when I when I Google Amy H. Carberry, she's still around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the gallery comes up on the screen, and um, so the vibrancy of what she cared about continues. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it, Sandra. You're welcome. You're very very welcome. So I, one of the one of the reasons I've wanted to have this conversation is because I am saying Amy H. Carberry Fine Arts Gallery all the time, <laughs> all the time. And, <laughs> uh, but there's a person, <laughs> it's not, it's not just a name, there's a person. So as I do with all these conversations, we should start at the beginning, you know, um, and, and you both, uh, have individually have, have described Amy in a, in a multitude of ways, but, but we should start off with what was Amy like, Gail, as a child? And what was Amy like as a sister growing up? Okay. Well, I Amy was always courageous. She was two years younger than her next sibling. She, we had three children, my husband and I, and um, the, the first two were two years apart. And she didn't think there was any difference between herself and her older brother. So everything that he did, she did two years earlier. He, <laughs> she just, you know, riding a bike, playing baseball. She was an incredible athlete, very active child. Um, she was an all-star on the Little League team, the boys' Little League team, when she was about seven years old. Um, she just was, she was always someone who was uh, ready to fly 
uh, and keep on moving. Just mm -hmm. an incredible spirit, mm -hmm. uh, smart as a whip, smart as a whip, puzzle maker. Mm -hmm. You know, she mm -hmm. uh, she enjoyed art, of course. Um, yeah. She also enjoyed being with people, although she was very shy. But mm -hmm. with people she loved, she was incredibly loving. Mm -hmm. And the animals. Animals. Oh, my gosh, animals. We had four cats and a dog at one mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. uh, all because of Amy, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she never could say no. Yep. So, uh, yeah, she was an incredible spirit. Mm -hmm. She was also mischievous. <laughs> and I think if you look at that little grin, there's a lot of tenderness, right? But there's also... I think you can see in her posture and in how she's carrying herself. She had a very wry sense of humor. She could be bitingly sarcastic in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. She loved abs um, absurd humor, mm -hmm. but she was definitely mischievous. And I think especially with my brother, there were, as my mom said, you know, incidents where she would uh, play a trick on him or two or five. <laughs> and somehow still come out, you know, looking the victim at the end. Um, <laughs> she she was also um, incredibly, uh, she was an, uh, a second mother to me in a lot of ways. And there's 10 years difference in age. Yeah, between sometimes, Amy sometimes and it was as if we were twins mm. of our, you know, personalities. Mm -hmm. But sometimes she was so fiercely loyal and maternal and protective that mm -hmm. I always felt um protected by her you mm -hmm. know um mm -hmm. deeply deeply caring mm -hmm. uh, but I I also just want everybody to know how silly she could be because she was shy and mm -hmm. most people who knew her may not have known that right, she was right. so graceful too she was yeah. so elegant and graceful in her bearing and how she carried herself and presented herself but then at home, you know, she'd sit with her very long legs, you know, twirled up like pretzels curled up, you know, in the chair. And and we would watch terrible B movies late at night on mute and put our own dialogue in there. And she would just have me in stitches, you know, so she was <laughs> very funny. When did she when Gail and Alice, when did you recognize that that she enjoyed art? Like, when did art become part of her interest you know I know you've described her as as funny and and maybe introverted but also like outgoing and but but art is a very like can yeah. be very interior thing like you mm -hmm. said you do it it's quiet I think it, it was for her for sure yeah but she did share her art with the people she cared most about mm -hmm. um but it was a, a solitary process for her often I don't know what, you know, maybe you can talk about what she was like when she was younger, but when she first started drawing, and I think she really did start with the whales, there mm -hmm. was a, a deep connection that she and I felt with um, cetaceans, basically, because <laughs> we had gone on a, a family vacation to Plymouth, Mass, and there was this incredible learning center there that was, I can't remember what it was called, but it, it was this like, whale discovery center. Whale discovery center yeah, that's yeah. right. And we, we had such an incredible time there and then went on a whale watch. And after that, I think she was really taken with the idea of just sort of the, the majestic nature, but the intelligence and the, this idea that something could be so massive, but also so graceful. Um, and so I think that was what, as an adult, as a young adult, mm -hmm. really got her interested in, in drawing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as a child, you know, she, you know, she, she completed art projects in school, like a lot of kids did. And she always had wonderful, colorful art pieces that she would do in school. I have a portfolio of some of her things from school, as we all do as parents. We try and figure out how many of them we can keep. And so, <laughs> uh, but, you know, and, and she went to a summer camp and she'd engage in craft projects and stuff. But I think when she was about 12, um, she engaged with Edith Bugby in a summer program, the College for Kids. Edith and I had been um, in, in school together, as in graduate school together at the University of Massachusetts, and we, she and I had become quite close. And so uh, when Amy enrolled with, with Edith, 
she really began to explore a little bit more about how to use the media, how to create what was in her head and transfer it to something that she could share yeah. with other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when it really began. Although, you know, that had not been her intent to become an artist. It was something she did that allowed her to express herself, to bring out the feelings that she had. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things Alice and I had spoken about some of her artwork. And well, as you know, as a person grows in their artistic talents, you know, their their technical skills can grow. But one of the things that was so incredible about every piece of art that Amy did of of life was that she captured spirit. Mm. If you look into the faces and the eyes mm -hmm. of who she created, mm -hmm. there's a majesty or there's a loving look or there's a look of magnificence. An intelligence in the eyes, yeah. I think, and mm -hmm. a, a she believed very firmly that animals have souls. And I think that you see that in what she tried to capture mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. a lot of her artwork. Yeah. And it also, I, I would not discount the fact that Amy's illness made her very patient. Mm. She learned to be very, um, she learned to pass a lot of time because mm -hmm. some of her choices were limited by right her inability to go out into the world as much as she wanted to. She had a dream of being a lawyer because she had a very deep sense of justice and fairness mm -hmm. and equity. Mm -hmm. um, but she knew that she had physical limitations that she couldn't necessarily, she, she wasn't able to go out and make those dreams a reality, yeah. but that yeah. also gave her determination mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and patience mm -hmm. and the ability to work for long hours on getting shading just the way she wanted it to be. And I think you notice, as I said, in particular around the eyes, she she paid a lot of attention and gave a lot of time and energy uh, yeah. to those details. So in these first two, in these first two works of art that we're looking at by Amy, they're pencil and paper, right? They're that was her medium. Yeah, that yeah, was they're not medium. very big, right? They're maybe no. 16 by 20. The mm -hmm. drawing itself is much smaller. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a lot of of shading. There is a lot of really, I mean, especially with this one that's on the screen right now, which is um, a, a picture of a lion. Um, that's hard to do. Like all of that hair coming around the face, yeah. right? The whiskers. We're kind of seeing it a little bit in profile, right? The bone structure. The bone uh, structure. Is it goes back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and 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 to your point, Allison, um, doing this kind of of work, artistic work takes time, mm -hmm. right? And it's yeah. lots of line work, right? Yes. And, and, and it's interesting you should say that um, because for Amy, it was even more uh, time, particularly toward the end of her life because she had lost her eyesight almost entirely uh, during her pregnancy with, with Brendan. And, and through some miracles and, and the good graces of some doctors in Boston, she was able to get most of it restored. Mm -hmm. um, but while she was while she was working, you know, without sight, um, she would sit cross-legged in the middle of her bed with her pad on her lap, sitting, looking as deeply as she could into what she could see on that page. Mm -hmm. And it was it was incredible what she could accomplish mm -hmm. in her perseverance um, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. accomplish what she wanted to do. Yeah. So that so we're we're referring to a, a, a progressive illness that happened around the age of 14, you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She was very healthy up until that uh, point. And then uh what happened with her was uh, I mean, uh some children, you know, develop juvenile diabetes late and she did at the age of 14. And some people think that, you know, if you take insulin and you take care of yourself, you'll be just fine. Uh, but despite her best efforts, she developed a complication that made it almost impossible to regulate her glucose levels. Mm -hmm. And um, she continued to progress or degress mm -hmm. um, into a, a state where she was um, losing her sight, losing her kidneys, losing uh, her, her uh, sense of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, that were happening to a young woman right uh, 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was very difficult. Do you think, do you think, Gail, that that having art as an outlet was well, and poetry too, because we, you know, right, right. The poetry. Poet, but the poetry, the art, was that a way, like a creative outlet that was really helpful? Do you think that like she became even more interested in art as a consequence of this? Oh, story? definitely. Yes, definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think she saw herself as an artist mm -hmm. as she progressed through it. Um, I think a lot of her poetry is very introspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a way for her to address her fears, mm -hmm. uh, address her her sense of um, her sense of isolation. Sometimes, mm -hmm. um, I think she was uh, incredible in the way she approached her life and. You never knew from the outside looking in uh, that there was so much pain. Mm. That you felt. She she didn't she didn't whine. She never. was never a person to say woe is me and, mm -hmm. and act as if you know it should have should never have happened to her. Probably shouldn't have shouldn't mm -hmm. happen to anyone. Right. She would have felt that it shouldn't happen to anyone. Right. I think also that the art. The poetry certainly was a way for her to express a lot of the things that she didn't necessarily express even to us um, mm -hmm. aloud. I think the art and in particular the work that she did with the animals was something that also let her feel an enormous amount of satisfaction and, and joy. And every human wants to feel mm -hmm. as if they are making a mark Right. Um, and every human wants to feel fulfilled. And I think completing her artwork one at a time, these things gave her, I think, a sense of satisfaction and pride that everyone wants to feel. And, and I will say, you know, she was largely self-taught. She did get some, um, you know, training. Right. But right. But much of what she learned to do, she did through sheer ride she wanted to improve right it's right. a passion for her right gail you said that she had worked, started at age 12 mm -hmm. right yeah um with with edith and then and obviously kept drawing we're looking at a draw, another drawing right now um from 90 1994 mm -hmm. um of a leopard i think yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah leopard yeah um Again, most of the work that we that we have, or at least I have here, um, you know, similar size, sixteen by uh, by twenty, pencil on paper, um, black and white, um, but with lots of lots of detail. Mm -hmm. um, and and whether she spent you know an hour doing this or a week, um, she obviously was dedicating a a, a, a lot of, of time to to this visual work. Mm -hmm. But we've also talked about the poetry. Um, I do, uh, and and I agree. It's very introspective. I think some of it, um, and to your point, Allison, about um, some of it just being like private in yeah. some respects, right? Like it wasn't necessarily written for an audience. However, there was one that struck me that I didn't feel that way about, and that I thought was okay. That, and I'm only going to read a portion of it because it's a much longer poem. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that we have in in a frame, so it also was was made to be displayed. Um, and, and so I'm only going to read a portion of this, but it's, it's uh, titled Hidden Places. Um, and I don't have a date on this one, but um, presumably it'll be around this time. Um, each of us has a hidden place somewhere deep within ourselves, a place where we can go to get away, um, think things through, to be alone, to be ourselves, which is exactly what how you're describing, Amy, during this time, you know. So she, And she goes on... Um, about what happens when you let someone in your life into your life, right? Um, and then it, it ends with um, that person adds a new perspective to our hidden realm, then quietly settles down into his corner of our special places, where a bit of himself or herself will stay forever, and we call that person a friend. Hmm. I just thought that was a lovely sentiment, um, and and I I wondered if 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 either of you knew how old she was when she wrote this. I think she was in her mid twenties. Yeah, I believe she was in her mid twenties. Um, so much of her social life was um, was uh, online. 
to be mm. honest. Um, in the early days yeah. of the internet. So yeah. we're talking like AOL chat rooms, you know, <laughs> dial up. Dial up. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, it was, um, it was a way for her to create new social connections that she couldn't develop necessarily mm -hmm. because of her, her physical limitations. This was probably the, this photo that you're sharing now from 1995. Yeah. Yep. This would have been one of the last times in Amy's life that she was well enough to go out into the world and make social connections the way traditionally, you know, they're done. Mm -hmm. um, but again, 1995, very shortly after that, the internet right. was born. Yes. And now, of course, it's so omnipresent in our lives and the idea of you know, creating and maintaining friendships with people all over the world is a is a reality. But she was almost a pioneer in a sense with regard to developing new means of of finding friends. Yeah. And, and um and I think it gave her a really necessary human connection outside of the family mm -hmm. um, that she needed. So hidden place Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is very it's important to me because I I mm -hmm. see it as evidence that she was while she was stuck at home a lot she was still herself out there in the world in some form yeah. and people were benefiting from knowing her and she was benefiting from yeah. meeting them yeah. yes and she was well loved very, very well loved by uh people that she met mm -hmm. uh, they expressed that to us mm -hmm. many times yeah this photo we're looking at right now, um, she's dressed all in white because at Ivy Day, uh, we we dress in all white on Ivy Day. It's the day before commencement. Um, and interestingly, Amy graduated in 95 mm -hmm. and I arrived in 95. So we missed each oh. other by, <laughs> by, I don't know, three or four. A period of days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much. <laughs> um, but before, but, but um, in, in, but we kind of skipped over like some of the real struggles that she was having. And she started at Smith, Gail, you said, mm -hmm. and then she had to take some time off, but that time off then was spent here at stick. Yes. Yeah. Talk a yes. little bit more about that. Yeah. And I think, yeah, she, um, she was accepted out of East Hampton high school, um, into Smith college directly. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was a good student, but I don't think she felt, she told us she didn't feel worthy. She said she thought that uh, her application had been put in the wrong place. I mean, to be fair, I felt the same way when I went to Wellesley. It was like, oh, there was an accident, right? Yes. Like, yeah. uh, but at any rate, she um, she finished her freshman year and her, her health had begun to deteriorate. Um, you know, when, when she was in high school, I remember in her senior year, she was having difficulty managing her her glucose control and and she would have episodes on the basketball court where she would just become you know can you see me you know kind mm -hmm. of uh yeah, low sugar very low know. sugar reactions yeah. Yeah. yeah and so she um she ended up uh at smith and at the end of that freshman year things began to deteriorate to the point where she couldn't really even move from her bedroom across the hall into the bathroom and maintain her balance mm -hmm. and so we sent her to boston to jocelyn clinic mm -hmm. and um, they discovered the root of the of the um, digestive issue that was um complicating her sugar control but her health had totally collapsed and she regretfully had to withdraw from smith but Two things were happening at the same time. She needed to maintain something of value to her. Mm -hmm. And education was always a yes. very important piece of who she was. And the other thing was I needed to maintain insurance coverage on her, to be honest with you. That was important too. Mm -hmm. And while she was a college student, that would be viable. And so she enrolled at Springfield Tech. Mm -hmm. And she told me, you know, mom, she says, I've had some of the best instructors, best professors in the world at Smith. Mm -hmm. And she says, and I've had professors at STCC. And I will tell you that the ones at STCC were better than the ones at Smith. 
And she believed that. I mean, she had a professor, Cherry Michaelman. I was going to say, yeah. Cherry Michaelman, who, he, 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 I don't know if you ever had an opportunity to meet her, but she was a no-nonsense Smith graduate. <laughs> and she taught her how to write an essay. Yeah. And she never felt unworthy again yeah. after she learned uh, from STCC professors mm -hmm. how to be an exceptional student. Mm -hmm. She met Larry Slezak. Yep. And she began to take courses with Larry in in art. And I think that's when she began yeah. to blossom yeah. in terms of her full interest mm -hmm. in art. One funny story I'll tell you was that he had a nude uh, model in, oh. in the... Um, <laughs> in the gallery one day and in the studio and um amy was drawing everything except the most basic anatomy and, and larry came by and looked at her drawing and said something's missing <laughs> she she looked up at him the same kind of face that you saw when she was a little girl looked up at him drew it real quickly and looked up at him and said satisfied <laughs> But that, you know, she really, uh, she loved STCC. She mm -hmm. truly did. Um, it was something that gave her a sense of purpose, mm -hmm. something that gave her a sense of esteem mm -hmm. um, and helped her to grow, I think, both internally and in terms of her art uh, that she loved so well. She was yeah. definitely in a, a regrowth period in mm -hmm. terms of her physical strength, but also in terms of her confidence and I have no doubt that the time that she spent at Stick was something yeah. that helped with that regard, especially yeah. with Larry Slezak and definitely with Cherry Michaelman. Yeah. I remember being invited to go and see Much Ado About Nothing when it was out in theaters, right? So you can see how old of that, how long ago that was, <laughs> with Cherry Michaelman and her husband and Amy. And and I remember, you know, being the very young. I think I was a tween or something, you know, uh -huh. I thought, oh, it was just so romantic and so sweet. And Amy turned and looked at me and was like, no, it wasn't, <laughs> you know, and I turned and looked at Cherry Michaelman and she looked at Amy with such pride, you know, just, <laughs> <sighs> but it was, that was a sense of, you know, that just goes to show you also that like, you know, Cherry saw her not just as a student, but mm -hmm. saw a whole package with mm -hmm. her that I'm mm -hmm. sure she saw with others as well. But it was a special, it was clearly a special relationship that was yeah. forged at STCC. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're looking at a drawing right now that is um, a monkey, right? But uh, I'm thinking, Allison, uh, about your comments about the eyes. Yes. Yeah. This, the yeah. gaze is like so direct, you know, yeah. and the focus yeah, very much. And the details are right around the eyes. There's personality there. Yeah, yeah. Totally. totally. You can, And if you go back and, and if people come to the gallery and look at the works, mm -hmm. I think one thing you notice about Amy's artistic style is that around the eyes, there is a little more definition. Yeah. There's a little bit more of a focus. It's almost as if it were a photo being taken with a very precise zoom in mm -hmm. and everything else kind of is just a touch hazier. And mm -hmm. I think perhaps that was purposeful on Amy's part. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as if she, you know, didn't feel the rest was finished. I think honestly for her, it communicated what she wanted to communicate, which was the idea that animals, just like humans, mm -hmm. have personality and mm -hmm. dignity. And mm -hmm. um, and I think you see it in, in many of the, in the mm -hmm. lions certainly, um definitely here in the in the yeah Chimpanzee. this would have been probably about a month after she graduated from smith mm -hmm. 6 3 1995 yeah. 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 yeah yeah um so she was at she was at stick for about three semesters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then uh she transferred her credits over to smith and she graduated um and i remember that day we were just all so excited for her you know, it's one of the things about Amy, I was talking with my husband yesterday about it, and it, anything she decided that she was going to put herself into, she did. She did, mm -hmm. yeah. And that was one of them. And the pregnancy with Brendan was another. Mm -hmm. She made mm -hmm. a serious commitment to have that child. Mm -hmm. It was something that was always in her life plan. Right. It was a miracle that he was conceived. And mm -hmm. I remember the uh, neonatal mm -hmm. specialist saying to her, because, you know, they told her that she would lose her sight and she'd lose her kidney function. She'd lose a lot of things if she went through this pregnancy. Mm 
Mm-hmm. She said um, she needed to decide. And the, I remember the neonatal specialist saying to her, was having a child always in your life plan? Mm-hmm. And she said, yes, it was. And he said, well, I can't promise you if you don't have this one that you will ever be able to fulfill that that right. wish. But he said, I'll do my best to help this one come into the world. And that was all she needed to hear. She got on the phone. She talked to doctors in Boston about restoring her sight. Mm -hmm. And she moved forward without Mm -hmm. any hesitation. Mm -hmm. That was so important to her. That was the kind of person she was. Mm -hmm. Determined. Very Mm -hmm. determined. Yeah. We're looking at another drawing. Um, this is this is also um, well of of leopards. There's two, and it's a it's an anniversary. It says uh, to mom and dad, happy anniversary, January sixth, nineteen ninety six. Yeah. So this is another one that we have um, here at the gallery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to part with that one, to be honest. But I'm glad I'm glad it it's available for other people. You know, mm-hmm. uh, especially also through this this uh, this presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to again mention the oh. eyes. Yeah, if you don't mind, can we go back to the cheetahs? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Even with the eyes closed. I was just going to say you know, eyes closed. Yeah, yeah. Eyes are closed, but you still feel the emotion and the love that radiates. Yep. You know so one cheetah's head is facing us, facing mm-hmm. the viewer, right? With eyes closed, with its with its chin on the bottom, or I, I'm the chin on the top. Sorry, of the other one, which is in profile, mm-hmm. facing to the right so Mm -hmm. yeah it's an interesting composition too it's almost like intertwined right yes Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. yeah yeah she doesn't have many with more than one i say that but i'm good um mother and child in the in the marine uh yes the 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 the, uh killer whales one there's more than one yeah but usually well at least in this collection it's usually a a single animal the focus On a single level, but this one is very different. Mm-hmm. Very, very different. Yeah. 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 I like that one a lot. Reminds mm-hmm. me a lot of my husband and me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. The, the two of us, huh? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. One of us snuggling and the other one oblivious. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Donald. <laughs> I can hear you. you know. oh. <laughs> oh. This is a, another portrait of a dog. Mm-hmm. Straight on. It looks like a beagle. Is this? Yeah, yeah this it's, it's a hound. Definitely yeah. a hound. Yeah. Hound, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, again, uh, that, that attention to detail around the eyes. You know, mm-hmm. floppy ears, and then you know, because it is really just the the head portion. You know, we don't see the full body of mm-hmm. the dog, but um, but I imagine if I saw this dog, I would be able to recognize them from this drawing, <laughs> and that's one of the really interesting things about about her about her work. You know, you would be able to recognize uh, this animal, yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly. You know, yeah. um, so <laughs> we've been talking about the the the. the uh, the birth of uh, Brendan, mm-hmm. um, and this is a very funny portrait. <laughs> we see uh, we see Amy holding uh, Brendan up with a um, uh, name tag <laughs> stuck to his forehead. <laughs> yeah, that says, <laughs> that says Brendan Carberry, um, and I'm not sure what it says below it. It says, well, his his uh, his father's name is Kumi, so it says Brendan Kumi parentheses Carberry. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if it said baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be very yeah. Amy uh, humor, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, that would be her. Just in case yeah. anyone just in case anyone was unsure. Right. Yeah. 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 Which one was the mother? And yeah, which one was the baby? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, he, he was born premature uh-huh. and neonatal intensive care for um three months. Mm-hmm. Um well, almost three months. Almost yeah. three months. Yeah. 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 And um so at any rate, they had a, a reunion of babies that were in a certain period of time in the neonatal at um, Bay State. Yep. And um, so that was that event. And so the name tag uh, she placed upon his head so they would be sure to remember. So they'd all see him. Yeah, they'd all know. Uh, here's another one. This is, yeah. this is a really beautiful, a very different kind of moment, right? You know, the, the yeah, first- This is, very, uh, I believe, Christmas Eve. 
Mm. And I, think I took this photo. Mm-hmm. Christmas Eve was always an extremely special time in our family. We had a very small house, um, but it was filled to the brim with love and joy. And every Christmas Eve, we would have uh, a, a dinner by candlelight. Mm. And this was a particularly special and joyful Christmas because this was the Christmas that we welcomed friends mm-hmm. home. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, he had been home not too long. No, not very when long this Christmas all. came around. And yeah. and honestly, one of the other things about when Brendan was born was that my sister contracted MRSA in the hospital and had to be separated from him after his birth for quite a mm-hmm. while. These were some of the first moments where she could really be the mother that she was. Right. right. That she right. had she had put herself through so much mm-hmm. to bring him into the world. Yeah. And now he was home. And you yeah. see her little you see her knee is bent there, right? Yes. Yes. That is exactly how my sister would always sit. <laughs> she would sit with her legs, her long limbs bent like that. This is one of the most natural things I think I've ever seen. And I'm sorry, someone that has the audacity to walk their dog in front of my house right now. So my dog is losing his proverbial mind that's okay that's all right so we're looking at this picture um we can tell it's christmas because well there's a poinsettia in the background <laughs> there's a poinsettia in the background there looks to be uh, he looks uh brendan is kind of looks like he might be dressed in something kind of christmasy i see a christmas green with little red um we, we can also see in the background maybe some christmas um stockings or something i definitely i think that's i think that might be a special snowman scarf oh uh, okay okay hung over there like i said it was a small house we didn't have a coat rack Um, (laughs) but uh, yeah you see a red coat and then that that snowman scarf in the background there yeah it looks like she's sleeping right Mm -hmm. and he's obviously so we don't really even see brendan because brendan we always see is the back of brendan um and you're right we see her knee and her eyes are closed and she's she's really like, like almost has this icon around her of the blue chair right, right. around her around her head yeah uh, this is a you also see her face at rest and mm-hmm. honestly mm-hmm. being as intelligent and bright and witty and um, just vibrant as her personality was with us at home you almost never saw her face peaceful and relaxed like that uh, um but i think that this also encapsulates who she was. She was, she could be quite serene, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, mm-hmm. and as I said before, you know, with me, she was almost like a, a lioness protector maternal with Brendan. Oh my goodness. You can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. And I, think, I do think the serenity that she felt in holding him. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely. She just, did, well, she did write a poem to him. Yes. Um, and it was something that was important to her. She addressed it to him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it was important. I think, to be honest, as I began reflecting on today, mm-hmm. looking at her artwork, looking at her poetry, I think she wanted to make sure something of her was left, something mm-hmm. of her for Brendan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think um, that's important. Yeah. Um, that he knows her through what she has left mm-hmm. and I think you know I can't think of anything else that she would have wanted more than anything than right. for him to know her definitely as she, as she was yeah was she still creating art at this time yeah when I, he was yeah. born yeah. Oh, yeah yeah we did yeah we we didn't yeah absolutely I think also she she had been moving a bit more toward poetry mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah he was he was two and a half when she passed Mm -hmm. and um so she and he bonded very well together um through those two and a half years and she was still working on on pieces of of art one way or another i did find a a foal uh, Mm -hmm. a drawing of a foal in her room after she passed Mm -hmm. Uh, it was probably her last piece of art Mm -hmm. and um it it was important to her Mm -hmm. to leave pieces of her Mm -hmm. her to to know Mm -hmm. her Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. remember me was one of her poems mm. memories i think it was in title this is what the gallery looks like today <laughs> well not, not in this exact moment but but close 
Yeah, um, it's spectacular. I'm so pleased that the college made an investment in art, mm -hmm. um, to be honest. You know, for me, I was uh, always interested in the technology side of the college, mm -hmm. always, you know, securing funds from the National Science Foundation and other organizations helped put the tech park together financially, get mm -hmm. that on its feet. And so to see the way that the administration, Andy Sibeli and others uh, embraced mm -hmm. the artistic side of, of STCC was so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. This is um, this was an uh, exhibition just in March, April, uh, exhibition of photography. Mm -hmm. um, but this brings me to impact, <laughs> legacy. Um, you know, when I was trying to quantify how many people have shown at the gallery, how many students have shown their work at the gallery, how many people are visitors to the gallery. <laughs> um, it was very hard to calculate, um, to be honest. You know, it's it's many hundreds of artists, many thousands of students, uh, many more thousands of visitors, you know. Um, I mean, obviously with the pandemic, we had a little blip there <laughs> um, with the pandemic, but, um, but, since coming back from the pandemic, you know, our numbers have have blossomed. And and so I can't thank you uh, enough as a family for having endowed this space because that that has definitely, you know, been a game changer. You, you endowed it um uh just how many months after Amy passed? Um uh, well, in truth, I endowed it prior to her death. Um, in anticipation of, I was, I, was, I was at a point in my life where um, I felt as if when she's had this child that I would need to look at my finances again mm -hmm. and make sure that she and Brendan would be protected. Mm -hmm. And um, in the course of that, um, I began to think about if a legacy were to be created. And certainly as a development officer, I wanted to make sure that I myself made a meaningful gift to Springfield yeah. Tech because it had always meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, I did make the commitment in advance of her mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was following her death. That it was you... following her death that we went forward with the naming of the gallery. Yeah. yeah. So that was, so 28, that was 2003, right? Yes, mm -hmm. 2003. 2003, yeah. So it's been just over 20 years. Just over 20 years, that's right. It's very yeah. hard to So I'm wondering if when you did that, mm -hmm. you know, did you, what did you imagine would happen? You know, did you have any, any preconceived ideas or? or well, I what, think, as I said, I, I knew that Springfield Technical Community College um, with all of its wonderful career programs um, had placed an enormous e emphasis on the sciences and technologies at the college. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to see was that the arts were not forgotten. And mm -hmm. I thought it was important that, after, particularly after Amy died, um, mm -hmm. the fact that they allowed the, the gallery to be named in her honor, mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was incredibly significant because to us, she was an artist. Mm -hmm. And this, was, this would be something that she would be head over heels about. Oh. Yeah, you know. I mean, she would be a little bit embarrassed and mortified that her name was all of it. But, but I do think also that that was one of the things that was really helpful for the rest of us when she passed was the idea that as Brendan grew up, there would always be a place that had his mother's name mm -hmm. on it. Right. And that was so deeply connected to one aspect of her identity, which was her artistic side and her her desire that there be communities of learning, mm -hmm. that there be open spaces for communities of learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she she truly, as my mom said, she valued education and it was her own education, but she also, I think, knew the value of education to society and not just 
the quote unquote practical right mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, aspects of education for society, but the the parts of education that open your soul, mm -hmm. parts of education that explore um, humanity mm -hmm. at a level that goes well beyond the practical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Permanent. You're, you're permanent. Yeah. yeah. You've both invested lifetimes though in yeah. higher education, right? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have much of a choice following this <laughs> example, right? But I said <laughs> no, but I mean really it was a um I think that's just part of who our family is and has always been, you know, and there was never any question in Amy's mind that education for for Brendan was going to be um deeply important, you know. Um but yeah, it was uh, impossible to grow up, you know, in our house and not see how incredibly important for society, not just for yourself, mm -hmm. um, an open-minded education is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is another um, aspect of the gallery that didn't uh, exist prior to 2013. Um, and so this wasn't here when it was endowed, but this is the camera obscura room. Um, so fascinating. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing it live and being so fascinated by it. <laughs> so basically, for those of you who don't know, camera obscura is a room. It can be any space that is made completely light tight. And then you make one small opening on the window and whatever is outside of that window um, appears inside and upside down um, because the laws of optics uh, say, you know, light travels in straight lines. And so I took this picture this morning as we were, as I was doing my final preparation for this conversation. And um, obviously it's a bright sunny day. <laughs> this is a spectacular <laughs> image. It doesn't always look like this and it changes with the seasons. And um, again, it's an extension of the gallery, always the gallery being something that I've wanted to um, go beyond just the, the physical space, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons we have a college art collection now where we acquire some work of exhibiting artists and that that work gets placed somewhere on campus. Um, you know, it's always that idea, and again, and with the Carberry Conversations, now we're virtual. We have this whole other programming, I don't want to say wing, because there's only one of me, <laughs> but, but, you know, this 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 opportunity to do to do more with with it, you know, that it's not just um, this, this uh, white walls. Um, Sandra, one thing about this particular part of the gallery is that it actually shows, you know, we sort of in the in the last few minutes have been talking about this sort of dichotomy that exists between science and technology and arts. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, they are often uh, two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And understanding science and technology is helpful in understanding art and vice versa. Absolutely. And they are inseparable, whether it be, you know, geometry and lines and forms and, mm -hmm. um, or if it's physics and something like this, right? And so um, I think that's a really important part of what I'm seeing in this photo. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for, for stating that. I mean, and I and I teach darkroom photography. So we can go into the chemistry. Yeah, oh, that's true. <laughs> Absolutely. There's the whole chemistry. Right. Truly steam. Yeah, truly steam. Truly steam. Yeah, exactly. steam. Yes, well, I definitely believe in steam. Um, there is, uh, let's see. I see Dr. John Cook's hand up, and I'm wondering if we have time for for one more uh, for sure. one more question or comment from. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if he's still here. Uh, let me see, Dr. Cook. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Hello. Hi, John. Madam President. <laughs> nice to see you. I don't well, see your face, but it's it's nice that you're hear your voice for sure. I, I would be remiss, Gail and, and Allison, if I first didn't thank you so much. The the legacy, the impact 20 years later, Gail. I it seems like yesterday that I sat with you eight years ago to think about my own tenure here mm -hmm. uh and to to really follow through on that. I I we cannot thank you enough. For this lasting imprint in this conversation today it's, it's our remarkable. joy it's our joy and our honor thank you for, for saying here's that. the part i wanted to take a, just a moment to share 
uh, Sandra, as you well know, has been a remarkable curator yes. for this legacy and for this gallery. You would be pleased to know that she was granted tenure. Yay! <laughs> so how could I not share that? That is part of our investment in Amy as well Thank with you. the way that that position that Sandra has is really part and parcel uh, to this. And the fact that it is it is baked in she has earned that tenure for for this and many other reasons. I just I just wanted to be sure you knew that news. That's fantastic. Wow. Congratulations. I think that's so wonderful. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you, so Doctor. I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll step out of the way. But again, wonderful to see you both. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you, John. Thank you again for just the way that you continue to help lift up this tremendous legacy for the college. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Cook. That was sweet. That was very yeah. sweet. Wonderful news. I, I, well, I, you know, I, he knew I wasn't going to mention it. <laughs> 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 I didn't know that that's why he was putting his hand up. <laughs> well, I think that's a wonderful sort of way to come to a close here is this idea that with tenure comes an idea of permanence and nothing can make me happier than knowing that the gallery is in such good hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and of all the things that I thought was going to make me emotional in this conversation, that's the one. <laughs> well, I do have one last question. Yes. Sorry, you're not. You might. You might still tear up, Allison. <laughs> Don't mean to make you cry more. But what would you say? Either you learned from Amy, or that Amy taught you. Uh, I remember something very, very distinctly. I mean, there are myriad things I could say but I was having <laughs> sorry yeah. I have to put it up this is this is this is Allison and Amy um in a cut out of Jaws <laughs> right um I don't know where but it's definitely most likely Plymouth Massachusetts okay. that was where we often went yeah, yeah. and um, you are you are both like emerging from the mouth of Jaws as yeah, but is. you'll notice Amy is appropriately looking scared and I'm saying ta-da Right. So it's a, she had a good laugh at my expense on that one. Uh -huh. um, Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, no. Thank you. Um, so I remember uh, when I was in college and I was I was struggling a bit. Um, I, I for the first time in my life, started experiencing a, um, chemical depression and mm -hmm. and I didn't know what it was or why it was happening. Right. And so um, I remember Amy and I used to talk almost nightly on the phone and she was going through such a difficult time. You know, her kidneys weren't functioning. She was struggling with so much uh, emotionally, you know, um, and I remember complaining to her about how I was feeling and then suddenly having this sort of wash of like, what an idiot you are. Stop stop burdening your sister with your inane, you know, troubles and worries and, and being upset. What do you really have to be upset about, you know, perspective wise? And I apologized to her and I was like, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I thought, you know, that I should unburden myself to you as if you don't have, you know, burdens. Mm -hmm. And she was quiet for just a second. And then she said, every single person's feelings are their feelings mm -hmm. separate and apart from who they are with relation to other people everybody's feelings are valid yep. especially to them nobody has a uh, the sole right to feel frustrated or sad mm -hmm. um, or happy and i remember that sometimes when i do feel a bit like my emotions are out of perspective mm. you know what what it means to what they need to be I remind myself that it's still okay to feel them mm. and to um that it's okay to feel feelings yeah perspective of you know the situation and the people you're with so um that was an important thing to me and then the last words she ever said to me is I was still suffering from depression and I was going on a spring break trip with friends in the hopes that that was going to shake me up a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I hugged her as I was about to leave for the trip. And she said, 
have fun. Mm. And I said, I'll try. <laughs> and she said, you will. Mm. And those were the last words that I ever had from her. And I try to remember that in life. Mm -hmm. right? Have fun. Have fun. And this idea of, well, all right, it's a burden, but I'll try. And then her just reminding me that it's possible and it's and it's gonna happen, right? That mm -hmm. that life is ultimately joyous and good. Mm -hmm. yep. What did you learn? Well, I think um, through through a lot of my younger years, you know, um, I had, I think I have uh, super woman woman syndrome sometimes when I was young, you know, bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan work a full-time job and go to graduate school too woohoo um and and i think sometimes um i would forget uh that um that there were certain things in my life that i was running away from um mm -hmm. even as i was growing and learning and developing and i think um the two things in my life that i really felt that i needed to learn in this lifetime was to trust and to accept and um, I think Amy's way of accepting and trusting was so profound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember saying to her, you know, I'm always astonished by you. I said, I know that if I was facing the same difficult situations that you face, the pain physically that you face, mm -hmm. never mind the emotional pain, that I would not be as loving and as cheerful as you are. I'm, I'm a bear when I don't feel well. Mm -hmm. And she, I said, how do you how do you do that? And she said, I can't change the situation of my life, but I can certainly have control over how I accept it, mm -hmm. how I face it. Mm -hmm. And that to me was very profound. Mm -hmm. The issue of being able to accept what is. Yeah. And uh, I think that was important hmm. very important well thank you both thank you so much for thank sharing you. i know we've been in the works with for this for some time now and the emails and the the notes and the sharing of pictures and the poems and the i know that this is difficult this has been difficult this is a challenging um uh thing to do right but I feel like um I know her so much better through... I'm glad you do I'm yeah. glad you do yeah I really do and now when I speak about Amy H Carberry it's going to come from more of a place of knowing a little bit more than I well I apologize again for the dog but I do know yeah. that if this if this is in the ethernet and Amy grabs hold of it she will okay. laugh like crazy over an animal in the middle of this discussion. Yeah. Because that was who Amy was. She well, maybe she sent it. That was <laughs> very possible. <laughs> Those sprinkle them, you know. <laughs> Make sure. Um, no, I really I can't thank you enough. I just want to remind people where we are. This is the Amy H. Carberry Fire Arts Gallery in Building 28 on the campus of Springfield Technical Community College in Springfield, Massachusetts where we um, not only have a fine arts program, which is growing, um, we have um, many amazing uh, art faculty who are teaching a lot of art classes to people who are not majoring in art, um, like Amy, uh, who was here many, many years ago, but certainly not to be forgotten. And I would love to have this, the Carberry family to the gallery this fall. Um, to come yeah. back in person and see whatever work is on. I don't know yet. Um, <laughs> whatever is on the wall. <laughs> I would love to, to um, host you and have a reception because there are many people, as I have been doing this research, who um, have so many uh, kind words about you, Gail, and that you are missed, you are thought of often and fondly. And um, Vin, even this morning, said something about, uh, what did he say? Uh, you know, uh, oh, those were the days in the 80s and 90s, you know. <laughs> so I don't know what you were doing back in the 80s and 90s, but Vin misses you. Um, yeah, I certainly miss a lot of folks there, too. And there, there are many, many other people who um, have, have many uh, wonderful things to say about you and your family. So I hope that we can do that this fall um, and, and yeah. take this opportunity to 
as your as your sister uh, said, you know, live life. Yeah. So thank you both very much. And, and thanks to everybody for, for listening in. And um, yeah. Thank you. Thank for you. Your life. Be well, everybody. Right. Thank you.